Hey y'all, Lauren here again. I'm a disability activist in Indiana and have been in the Medicaid provider world for over 20 years. We gotta talk. No, I'm not breaking up with you, no worries there. But if we don't do something very soon, the Supreme Court might break up with our civil rights. There's an upcoming Supreme Court case that has been flying under the radar despite myself and a handful of other disability activists screaming about it to anyone who will listen. Uh, apologies to our significant others there. The case is Health and Hospital Corporation, Marion County, Indiana versus Georgie Tlesky. Just gonna say HHC from now on instead of Health and Hospital Corporation, by the way. The fact that more folks aren't talking about this case is horrifying because if this case is heard by SCOTUS, there's a big chance that our civil rights are gonna be low key taken away. I think one of the main reasons that this case isn't getting a lot of coverage is because it's confusing and difficult to explain exactly why it's so damn scary. So buckle up, I'm going to attempt to explain it. I want to jump right into the details of the Tlesky case right away, but we can't do that just yet. We have to talk about a few things first. They're legal things and they're kind of boring, so to keep you awake I'm going to randomly show pictures of cute cats while I'm talking for the next few minutes. Let's hit fiscal federalism first. That sounds real fancy, but it's really quite simple. Basically, for programs like Medicaid, the state throws money into the pot and the federal government throws money into the pot. A lot of people think that Medicaid, like Medicare, is solely a federal program. It's not. Although every state has Medicaid, it looks very different depending on how much money a state throws in and what plan that legislators come up with. Other examples of fiscal federalism are public schools and food stamp programs. When the federal government throws money in the pot this way, the state has to play by its rules. This means that a state can't threaten to or deprive a person of their rights guaranteed by the United States Constitution or federal law. Kind of like, well, you may be 18, but as long as you're living under my roof, you gotta follow my rules. Ever heard that one, kid? So how can big mama federal government make sure that the states keep in line? Well, a couple of ways. The first, is that the federal government can investigate wrongdoing. This may come as a surprise, but the federal government doesn't move quickly, and a lot of times it isn't super effective. Yeah, shocking, I know. Even when the feds do these investigations, one of the only ways they can punish states is to withhold federal funding. This is the last thing that folks in lifeline programs like Medicaid need is for funding to be lowered. Y'all still awake? Okay. The other way that the federal government makes sure that states don't deprive their citizens of rights is through Section 1983 lawsuits. This is where I need y'all to really, really pay attention. Law professor Miriam E. Gillis sums up best what Section 1983 is. She says, Section 1983 is a law intended to combat the widespread practices of local, including state, officials. When a state takes away or threatens to take away a person's rights that are guaranteed by the United States Constitution or federal law, Section 1983 provides a way to sue for damages, injunction, or other relief. See, Section 1983 itself is not a source of concrete rights, but rather a way to defend existing rights, like the right to bear arms, freedom of speech, freedom from warrantless searches, and freedom from police brutality. If your rights are a car, then Section 1983 is the fuel that makes it go. A car without fuel isn't really a car, it's a sculpture because it can't go anywhere. Just like how rights that don't have a way for you to defend them in court aren't really rights. They're just fancy ass words on a piece of paper. Section 1983 basically gives two remedies for a person whose rights have been taken away or have been threatened to be taken away. One, damages. That is actual loss or out-of-pocket expenses. You sue and get money from the state or local government. SCOTUS has limited this over the years though, and you can't be awarded any money for a violation of a constitutional right unless you have proof of actual injury. The other remedy is injunctive relief. This just means the court telling the states, uh, y'all can't be doing that, stop. Injunctive relief is an extraordinary remedy involving the exercise of very far-reaching power and is granted only sparingly and in limited circumstances. I don't have time to go into the full history of Section 1983, but wanted to give you a little bit, wanted to tell you a little bit, to give you a taste of how important it is. 
Section 1983 is the codification of the Civil Rights Act of 1871, or as it's sometimes called, the Ku Klux Klan Act. President Grant signed it into law to ensure that states and local governments didn't undermine the 14th Amendment. You know, the one that eradicated slavery in the United States. Section 1983 sat dormant for 90 years or so. Then, the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s happened, along with two huge SCOTUS cases that used Section 1983. Monroe v. Payton and Manel v. Department of Social Service of the City of New York. These cases paved the way for an explosion of Section 1983 cases since. In 1990, there were close to 10,000 Section 1983 cases filed in U.S. District Courts. In 2015, over 16,000 filings. And just last year, in 2021, there were 14,613 Section 1983 filings in U.S. District Courts. I throw these numbers out there to show you that Section 1983 claims aren't some rare things. In fact, the majority of all civil rights claims filed in U.S. District Courts in the past decade have been Section 1983 claims. And just so we're on the same page here, Section 1983 was created to ensure that states wouldn't go against the 14th Amendment and strip away the rights of black folks. But now it's used for all civil rights. Yes, lawyers, I know that isn't the best summation probably, but uh, you know, it gets the job done. So what are the common types of Section 1983 claims? Oh, you know, just little old cases like ones that protect your freedom of speech, your right to not be punished at work for your political affiliation, freedom from police knocking down your door without a warrant, freedom from police arresting you without probable cause, your right to not have the living shit kicked out of you by police, your right to due process, your right to not be fired or discriminated at or at work for being the wrong color, religion, sexuality, or having a disability. I mean, who values those things? Seriously though, Section 1983 claims are incredibly important and are one of the only ways that folks like us have to make sure that our state and local governments don't strip our constitutional rights away. Now that you know what Section 1983 is, let me scare the shit out of you a little bit. So we're going to stop the cats for now. If SCOTUS sides with the HHC in the upcoming SCOTUS case, HHC versus Tlefsky, then this may be the beginning of the end of Section 1983 as we know it. It will mean that folks who are in federal spending clause programs will lose their ability to bring a claim under Section 1983 when they're discriminated against, abused, neglected, or denied coverage in the first place. Oh, jargon alert, spending clause programs basically means when the government throws money states way and then the state throws in money too for its citizens' welfare. The biggest, most well-known spending clause program is Medicaid. As it stands now, in order for a state to get federal money for its Medicaid program, the state has to follow federal standards. Standards like it can't discriminate and must honor federal law and constitutional rights. Right now, in order to get federal funds, a state must hold that certain folks, like poor folks and people with disabilities, are guaranteed Medicaid coverage. This is what an entitlement program is, when benefits are guaranteed to a particular group or segment of the population. Besides Medicaid, some other spending clause entitlement programs include Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Programs, SNAP, and Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF. How many people are on Medicaid, SNAP, and TANF? According to the 2020 census, 84 million people. That is 26% of the total U.S. population. The majority of these folks are women, and 37% of all Medicaid users are children. If Tlefsky is overturned by SCOTUS, then states can just basically get rid of their entitlement programs effectively. I say effectively because if the state just denies your right to access these programs, then without Section 1983 protections in place, you can do nothing about it at all. There's no entitlement without a guarantee of coverage. Lauren, that can't be right. I'm sorry to say it is. Oh, also, you would lose your rights in Medicaid to be protected from abuse, neglect, and discrimination. Pretty great, huh? So that brings us finally to the actual SCOTUS case, HHC versus Georgie Tlefsky. I didn't want to start here because y'all need to know some other stuff first. And also, I was afraid if I started with the details of this case, y'all would just assume, like a lot of others have, that this is just a nursing home case and doesn't have an effect 
on you. It is absolutely not that and absolutely will affect you or people that you love. Here's the rundown. Due to progression of dementia, Georgie Tulesky's family found a secure memory care unit for him at Valparaiso Care and Rehab in Valparaiso, Indiana, owned by the HHC and ran by American Senior Communities. When Georgie entered the nursing home, he was able to walk, communicate verbally in English, his mother language was Macedonian, by the way, feed himself, and recognize loved ones. Eight months later, Georgie couldn't do any of those things. Was it because of the progression of dementia? No. It was because Georgie was being inappropriately doped up with psych meds that the family didn't know about nor give them permission to administer. In fact, they were giving him six different types of psych meds a day to keep him in a permanent stupor. The family found a private neurologist who assisted with the inappropriate psych meds removal, and the family filed a formal complaint against the facility. After the family did that, Valparaiso Care and Rehab began to retaliate against Georgie by sending him to a hospital over an hour away from family over and over again. Eventually, Valparaiso Care and Rehab simply refused to pick him up at all from the hospital. This is what's called patient dumping. Finally, without the family's permission or knowledge, the nursing facility sent him to another nursing facility over two and a half hours away from his family members. Guess who the company was owned by? You got it, the HHC. By the way, see my other video about those shit words. Because the HHC is government owned, the family was able to successfully file a section 1983 on the grounds that Valparaiso Care and Rehab violated Georgie's rights that were guaranteed him by the Residence Bill of Rights. This Bill of Rights was codified in federal law in 1987. These rights include the right to not be abused or neglected, the right to make complaints without being punished, the right to not be chemically restrained because it's convenient for staff, and the right to be the right to not be unfairly transferred or discharged because the nursing facility doesn't like you. You know, everything that the nursing home did to Georgie. Pretty open and shut, right? It actually is. You don't have to just take my word for it. That's also what the U.S. 7th District Court thought, too, when it sided with the Tlefsky family. There was no split in the court or controversy. HHC, of course, appealed to the Supreme Court because, God forbid, they get punished for abusing a resident of theirs. Money's all that matters with the HHC. I'm quite convinced that if one of the HHC board members were faced with a decision to save their mom from a burning building or to grab a bag of cash, they would be going home with Mr. Benjamin Franklin. Anyway, so why did SCOTUS take this unassuming, uncontroversial, straightforward case? Well, we have some guesses, but we don't exactly know. However, we do know that it is incredibly likely that if SCOTUS sides with the HHC, then 55 years of judicial precedent would be gone in a heartbeat. Also, the rights of Medicaid, TANF, and SNAP users, 84 million people would also be gone. This could set up a scenario where states could simply stop providing lifeline supports to billions of people in mass. Millions of children could lose medical insurance and also have no food to eat because their mother's food stamps were denied. Folks in nursing homes would lose protections to be safe from abuse and neglect. Professor at George Washington University, Sarah Rosenbaum, sums it up best, quote, This case is to Medicaid what Dobbs was to abortion. Y'all, this is not a drill. Listen, I don't think that the board members of HHC are evil, but you gotta understand that it's a pretty evil act to put profits over people. And this is how real, not fairy tale Disney evil works, though. It's bureaucratic. It's doing what's best for your company. It's just business. It's what your corporate attorney advised is best. It's never personal. Evil acts typically aren't elaborate productions. They're pretty boring things done behind closed doors, which is what's happening here. And if you think the use of the word evil is too strong of a word, I'm going to agree to disagree. I think that when a corporation is actively seeking to take away the rights and protections of some of the most vulnerable people for their benefit is evil. 
I think that pushing a case forward that could lead to the poorest of poor children going hungry and without medical care is evil. I think that stripping protections that keep elderly and disabled folks safe from abuse, neglect, and restraint is evil. Capital E. HHC has the chance to make this right. It can drop the case before oral arguments begin on November 8th. This is what us activists have been pushing for for several months. You can help us push by clicking on the link in the vid description. Uh, sources are going to be down there too, of course. I don't want to be a scared one. We have enough fear and loathing in our country right now. I just want to say, though, that once SCOTUS starts pulling at a thread of stripping personal liberties, it won't be long before the whole sweater is gone. Y'all, it's just like Angela Davis says. If they come for me in the morning, they will come for you in the night. 